and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. With the new farm bill still a work in progress, many producers are left wondering about the status of disaster relief and other programs. So we turn to our Ag Policy Specialist, Jody Campici, for guidance. What do you need to tell producers about the pasture, rangeland, and, and forage insurance? The Pasture, Rangeland, and Forage Insurance Program is a fairly new insurance program that's available to Oklahoma producers as well as producers in some of the other states. It covers forage for grazing and forage to be harvested for hay. It is a program administered by the Risk Management Agency, or RMA, and it's sold through private crop insurance agents. And how it works is it only pays on rainfall. So. If the historic rainfall in an area is, uh, if actual rainfall falls below the historic rainfall, then producers would get a payment. So they just go into a local crop insurance agent. They choose two, at least two uh, two-month time periods called index intervals. On those are the periods of time that are most important to their operation, most important for rainfall. Now, one important thing to mention is that it doesn't cover rainfall on a particular farm or even a specific weather station. It's actually, uh, it's based on like a 12 by 12 mile grid and so if the producer's farm falls within that grid then that would be measured by the rainfall within that grid. So again, it's producers don't turn in production, they don't have to turn in losses, it's just if it doesn't rain uh, and they're signed up, they get a payment. Okay, and you mentioned it's relatively new. A lot of people don't necessarily know about it or maybe think they qualify. Yeah, that's what I've been noticing is that it's, you know, it's a program mostly for livestock producers. So many livestock producers don't actually have crop insurance, so they wouldn't be going to a crop insurance agent and finding out about it. So uh, a lot of people don't know that it's out there because we, you know, in the past we haven't had too many programs that actually covered forage. So in th what producers can do is there's a decision tool on the risk management agency website. They can go and look at uh, plug in information for their own farm and see what kind of indemnity and what kind of premium they would have paid from uh, 1948 to the current year just to get an idea of how the program works. Now they still have to go to their local crop insurance agent to actually sign up but uh, I recommend going to that website just to see get a feel for how the program works. Okay and people probably especially interested with prolonged drought I'm sure. Uh, definitely. In, in 2011 the examples that I had ran for 2011 uh, for most you know, most of the time periods that I chose, it paid off. And definitely, uh, so it's haying and grazing. Hayland is more expensive, so the premiums are higher, it's worth more. Uh, grazing land is, is cheaper, so the premiums are less, but producers can choose any amount uh, up to 150% of an established county value. That's what RMA goes in and establishes a value for the county, say this is how much grazing land is worth and this is how much uh, pasture land is worth. So. Uh, they can you know, choose their coverage levels, choose uh, how much insurance they want to buy. They don't have to insure all their acreage either for the program. Okay. Let's switch gears and also talk about the acre program. You have some updates for producers this week. Yes. So producers who signed up for the 2011 acre program may get a payment on wheat. Now, uh, the state trigger for wheat in Oklahoma has been met. But this doesn't mean that all producers in Oklahoma will actually get a payment because the farm trigger also has to be met. So a producer would have to, their farm uh, benchmark guarantee would have to be greater than their actual revenue for this to be met. So some of the farms that I've looked at, it's been about half and half, where about half of the farms met the trigger, about half of the farms didn't. Now at this point in time, uh, FSA is not making payments on Acre yet and they won't be able to tell you right now what your payment will be if you go into the office. It'll still be another month or two, but the prices and, yield, uh, prices and yields for Acre are, have been determined, but the actual Acre payment through FSA has not been determined yet. Okay, so a little bit more time yeah. on that. Okay, Jody, thanks for the updates. Jody Campici, our Ag Policy Specialist. And for information on the topics that Jody talked about, just go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Certainly we realize that over the last two years, a lot of the cow herds have already been culled down to just those cattle that we think we can still take care of. But going into October, November is the time that typically cow culling takes place in many of the spring calving herds. 
I think it's very, very important then that we keep in mind that we do proper cow culling. What do I mean by that? Primarily, it's that we cull cows only at a time when we're going to provide a, a very safe, wholesome product for the consuming public. We do that by making sure that we don't cull and market any cows until after any kind of withdrawal time of a medication that they might have received. Let me give you an example. If a uh, particular medication, and you read on the label, and it says it has a 14-day withdrawal time, and you gave that medication on the first day of October, the 15th day of October is 14 days later, and so it's on the 16th that you can then safely market that particular animal. Knowing withdrawal times and making sure that you pay close attention to them is extremely important. As we're culling cattle, there's really four rules that I think uh, you really need to keep in mind to make sure that certainly we're providing a safe product and you're protecting your own operation. Number one, have a relationship with your local large animal veterinarian. That veterinary patient-client relationship is very, very important in case there's any questions at all. Number two is to market those cattle only after withdrawal times have passed and we know that it's safe to do. The third rule is to make sure that you use only medications that are approved for cattle and those medications that have been prescribed by a veterinarian. Finally, number four, keep good records. A detailed set of records as to when a particular medication was given, how much, the lot number, the site and the route of administration, who gave it, and then the withdrawal times all being recorded can be very, very helpful. And we've put a link up on the SunUp website so that you can get some ideas of some example kinds of records that you might want to keep for your cow herd to make sure that if there's any question of a potential violative residue, or if you have a question as to how long the withdrawal time should be, you can go to those records and find that information readily available for you. If you'll keep these four rules in mind, I think that you can do a really good job of marketing the cattle, not provide a black eye for the beef industry, and certainly be a whole lot better off in terms of avoiding any potential litigation due to violative residue of culling cattle from your herd. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SunUp's Cow-Calf Corner. Now to our other animals, our pets, who will need to evacuate with us in the event of an emergency. September is Emergency Preparedness Month, so we touched base with the OSU Center for Veterinary Medicine. When wildfires raged in Payne County this summer, homeowners had little warning. Evacuate, grab what you can and get to safety. Some had no choice but to leave pets behind. If you have the opportunity to evacuate and you're told in advance that you need to leave your home or that you may be out of your home for a day or two, just assume the worst and that you may be gone longer. And so if you need to, and if you have the ability, take your pets with you. Dr. Laura Sipneski is a small animal clinician. She recommends assembling an emergency kit. At a minimum, she says pets need proper identification or a microchip. Also, make an extra copy of medical records. The veterinarian contact as well as the rabies vaccination certificate and any notation of medical problems that the animal may have but then also a, a phone number of someone who is not in the immediate area, maybe someone out of state that you would be in contact with throughout the evacuation. So if for some reason you're separated from your pet and they can't get in touch with you, that they can get in touch with either a family member or a friend who knows that they're the emergency contact. An emergency kit should contain a leash and collar, litter box and litter for cats, food and water for four to seven days, and well-labeled pet prescriptions, regular flea, tick, and heart meds, and a pet carrier. If your pets are not transportable, then I think it's very important that you have a notation at the front of your house saying that you have pets, that you, what pets are on the premises, where they may be located, 
and then also where your emergency preparedness kit is located. So that way, rescue personnel can easily access that information and be able to then transport or treat your animals in a, in a way that's safe for your pet, but also safe for your rescue workers. Keep in mind, with tensions running high during an evacuation or emergency, animals may become more aggressive than usual. The bottom line, planning ahead can save lives. A little bit of time, a small amount of money expenditure, and a little bit of preparation will save many animals from potentially losing their life during a um, evacuation, but then also from, keeps pet owners from staying in their homes when they need to evacuate. For an emergency kit checklist for pets and other animals, visit sunup.okstate.edu and click on show links. We're talking now about the long-term outlook for rural economies with Demona Doy, our Extension Farm Management Specialist. And Demona, what are some of the things that people are telling you they're concerned about? I think longer term, people are un concerned about uncertainty as well as volatility in, in the markets. And so uncertainty relates to not only policy, such as the farm bill, but also what's going on in the global economies, uh, whether we're coming out of the recession globally uh, as we have stabilized in the U.S. or whether there's still more fallout to come. And obviously drought plays into that as well and, and it is mixed, it is in the mix, so to speak. Sure, drought's more of a short-term concern, at least we hope, um, and that impacts decisions, but we have an upcoming conference in which we hope to focus more on the bigger picture and long-term outlook, uh, focusing on things like globalization, the role of the Federal Reserve Bank and its policies on not only agriculture, but also the rural economy in Oklahoma. And you're helping to organize that conference. Tell us a little bit about it and some of the uh, speakers and topics that people will be exposed to that day. Okay, we're excited to host uh, Richard Crowder, who's a distinguished alumnus from OSU. He's held a variety of interesting uh, industry roles, but also served as the chief negotiator for the U.S. and trade policies. So he'll be joining us to talk about globalization and its impacts on Oklahoma and agriculture. So I expect that he'll talk not only about what's going on in Europe, uh, but also what's happening in China and Africa in terms of population growth, as well as the, uh, the need for nutrition in those countries. And so that indirectly impacts us um, through our export markets and certainly what's happening in the global economy impacts uh, prices that our, our producers will receive. Another of our keynote speakers is Chad Wilkerson, who's at the Federal Reserve Bank in Kansas City. And so he'll be ta focusing more on domestic, but again, it's impacted by global markets. But he'll be talking about things like inflation, uh, manufacturing and its role in uh, growth in the economy and in our region, um, and things like that. In addition, we have uh, a representative from the Environmental Protection Agency who will be talking about uh, ag and the environment. And so that's another area of policy where producers often have concerns about what's going to change and uh, how that might impact them. Uh, Bart Fisher, who works with Congressman Lucas and is a senior economist working on the Farm Bill negotiations will also be joining us and so it'll be interesting to see what kind of an update they have on that perspective. Okay, and the, the conference is geared toward producers, people in the financial industry, a good mix come that day. Right, all of the above. So people who are either trying to make decisions for the long term, people who advise producers, those in the ag industry, we're sending specific invitations to government agency people as well as agricultural lenders, uh, cooperatives, and so on. So we hope that everybody will join us. Okay, and wh where, where and when, the details on that? Uh, November 9th is the actual conference. There'll be a reception on Thursday evening the 8th here in Stillwater at the Alumni Center. So we hope everybody will come. Okay, Demona Doy, thanks a lot. And for more information on the Rural Economic Outlook Conference, you can just go to our website, senup.okstate.edu.
Hi, welcome to Shop Stop. Today we want to talk about flaring pipe and uh, tubing and, and some of the different ways that you can do that. Yeah, you've got the regular flare, which you see quite a bit, but we're going to show you how to do a double flare as well uh, that you might see on, for example, a brake line. So the first thing, you know, when you, when you, uh, you put your pipe uh, or your tubing inside your, uh, your clamp, you want to have it at the right depth using your, uh, your gauge on the, the piece here and pulling it together. Fire in the right one. Is that quarter inch? Mm -hmm. One tip, you know, if, we, if we're using copper, the copper will hold in here pretty easily and you can get a pretty good grip on it with, uh, with your clamps here. But if you've got something, some steel tubing that you're trying to flare, it's a, it's a lot harder to grab that and hold it in place. And a lot of times we'll see uh, somebody will grab these with the channel locks and start to tighten it up and then you break them off. Probably the best thing to do is just to clamp this piece in your vise on your workbench. So you can take this, clamp it in the vise, and then you'll get a really good bite on it uh, that way. Okay, once you've got that set, and, and if you've got a double flaring tool, it's going to have this little die set with it and you set that like Randy did and you just turn it upside down and then take your tool and need more hands. There we go. Make sure it's locked in place. Spin it till your tool seats on the on the main bar here back it off then you'll remove that little insert and you'll come back to it finish flaring it and then that's called a double flare now the thing that your uh, your tool is doing for you here it's taking that edge of your pipe on your, on your tubing and it's just rolling it to the inside a little bit so that when you come back and uh, and flare it with the other piece then it's it's kind of curling that lip over and pushing it back out and then you if you're not going to do the double flare way you can do the single flare which there's an example of yet you can see that it's not near as thick this has a little more thickness to it than than a single flare this would be used on something like most gas lines and whatnot so there's some tips on flaring tubing. We'll see you next week on Shop Stop. Coming up Monday, there's a pretty big deadline, and Kim, let's talk about what happens Monday. Well, Monday's the last day that producers can sign up uh, for crop insurance. Uh, normally, that uh, on the last day of the month, but since that's over over the weekend, they have until October the first. Okay, and speaking of crops, we have a little bit of green popping up here in the field. Let's talk about the wheat planted acres. Well, that's the chatter in the market is that uh, the wheat planted acres uh, will be higher this year, and I think that is no question in soft red winter wheat areas that will will have higher higher planted acres. Hard red winter wheat, wheat planted acres, that's questionable. Oklahoma will probably be about the same. You know, we're going to have an increase in canola planted acres, and uh, that's going to that's going to reduce some of our uh, wheat planted acres. But I still think it's going to be the same as last year, at least in this location. Let's talk a little bit more about the canola planted acres. Well, if you look at uh, canola, I just uh, visited with a few people. I don't have a, of course, nobody knows the right, exact number, right. but they're talking about a shortage of canola seed, uh, having a hard time getting it. And to me, that implies a lot of producers are going to plant canola. I know I was uh, talking to one producer, and he's going not from the third, third, and a third, in other words, a third canola, two thirds wheat. He's going to go 50 50. He really likes canola. Okay, let's talk about some uh, prices of wheat and corn. What are you seeing in the markets right now? Well, wheat's holding relatively uh, well, you know. It's on that sideways pattern on the December contract from about 880 to uh, to uh, 960 right. somewhere in that. It's getting down close to that uh, $8.80. But we've seen uh, corn prices drop off, you know, 50, 75 cents. Uh, corn is, uh, I think, has a downtrend going right now where wheat is still moving on its sideways pattern. So corn's actually going down. Why is that happening? Well, we talked about that about, uh, you know, the last five or six mm -hmm. weeks that uh, wheat broke loose from corn you know as we came through right. the wheat harvest in summer uh, wheat was wheat prices were dependent upon corn prices wheat's divorced from corn now uh, you can also look at uh, corn prices going down it's reports that uh, three large companies have uh, 
are importing 750,000 metric tons, just short of 30 million bushels. Okay, now wheat producers want to know that magic question, should they sell wheat? If they've got that plan, they're following the third, third, and the third, they need to sell that second, third right now, September, October, early October, the final third, they need to sell it in November and December. Okay, Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. In September, we switch from summer to fall. This year, the last day to have 100 degree temperatures was September 7th. With a cold front sweeping across Oklahoma that day, the air temperatures at 550 ranged from a high of 107 degrees in Walrika down to a low of 63 degrees near Enid. While Rika's September air temperatures show the switch from summer to fall, the first part of September started out with highs dancing around 105, with September 7th climbing to 109 degrees. Seven days later, the daytime high was a cool 65 degrees. A week after that, the highs had climbed back up to a hot 95, but were dropping again after the 24th. Hinton had a big switch in air temperature on Tuesday, September 25th. At 8.20 in the evening, it was 85 degrees with an average wind speed of 16 miles per hour. Ten minutes later, the temp was 64, 21 degrees cooler. After another 10 minutes, the average wind speed jumped to 32 miles per hour and a 54 mile per hour wind gust was recorded. That was biting. Checking the burn ban status as of September 26th, counties colored red were still under the governor's burn ban. Three yellow counties had county burn bans. Counties colored white had no burn bans in effect. Gary, oh, how we need rain. How are we faring as we enter October? Good morning, everybody. I certainly hope you receive some rain from this last storm system. Now as we take a look at the latest U.S. Drought Monitor map, please remember that this map was produced before the majority of the rainfall from this last storm. So I'm afraid it looks just as bad as it did last week. In fact, it looks exactly as bad as last week. Now we probably could have increased the exceptional drought coverage across the state this week, but since the rain was so close to the end of the period, we wanted to wait and see what that would do for us. So we'll take a look next week at what happened with this week's rainfall. We still have 42% of the state in exceptional drought, however, on the latest drought monitor map. A look at the national drought monitor map shows the center of the country still taking it on the chin with the drought. Over 55% of Nebraska, Kansas, and Oklahoma covered with exceptional drought. One of the biggest impacts we saw this summer from the drought was the damage done to vegetation. You can see that in this departure from average greenness map for September 18th through the 24th. Lots of damage done to the vegetation in the western two-thirds of Oklahoma, also up in north central Oklahoma. And again, up and down the central plains of the United States, from South Dakota all the way down to Texas. Again, the majority of this data was accumulated before the rains of this week, so hopefully we'll have better news to report next week. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. The cattle on feed report is out and the numbers are slightly down. Here to talk about that and explain what it all means, Daryl Peel, our livestock marketing specialist. Daryl, break down this report, tell us what the numbers are. In the, uh, the latest USDA cattle on feed report, the uh, placements were down. They were expected to be down, but they were down even more than expected. Um, and marketings were also down a little bit for the last month in August. And so the, the net, net effect was that the September 1 cattle on feed was slightly lower than a year ago. And that's the first time, actually only the second time in 28 months that the cattle on feed inventory month to month has been down from the year previous. All right, let's talk about why that is and kind of the, the long-term implications of that. You know, it's the, the other side of this that's probably more amazing is how feedlots have been able to maintain inventories for so long, given that calf crops have been getting smaller for the last several years. And, and the, the way that's happened, particularly last year with the drought, we placed a lot of very lightweight calves in the feedlot that stay in there for a long time. And so they hold up your inventory, uh, but not necessarily imply more cattle numbers. And
And what we're seeing now is that we're sort of running out of that possibility. We're placing not only fewer cattle in total, but we're placing a lot less of those lightweight animals. And that means that feedlot inventories are going to turn over much faster in the coming months, and it's going to be more and more difficult for feedlots to maintain inventories. I expect that cattle on feed inventory to, to continue shrinking for, for many months now from this point on. Any implications for the market then? Well, I think the, the reality of where we are with these feeder markets is going to be more apparent from now on. Uh, you know, the prices we have today certainly confirms that we have very tight feeder cattle supplies, and, and, and I think that's just going to get even more pronounced as we go through the next, you know, and really we're talking about a couple of years out in general uh, where we're going to see very, very tight feeder cattle supplies, and, and that'll be reflected in the markets. All right, and let's turn to stalkers now. It, it's that time of year wheat's either in the ground or getting ready to go. We've had some rains. What does the situation look like for stalkers right now? Well, I think a lot of producers, because there is some prospect, uh, certainly in, at least in some regions for, for wheat pasture, are going to be thinking about buying calves. Given what we just talked about, uh, you know, the prices of these calves are, are, are high already. They've recovered a lot from the summer lows. Um, you know, they, they often go down a little bit into the fall when we have our, our biggest runs of, of weaning calves. However, this year, those runs will be smaller and, and there's a good chance we won't see those prices drop very much. So producers need to keep that in mind as they think about buying these calves. There's a wide range of weights that they can buy at. And so I guess my advice to producers is to pencil it out and pencil out a number of different alternatives in terms of the kinds of calves, the size of calves that you can work with in your operation and see what really pencils out to be the best best alternative for you. All right, good advice. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Finally today, we're happy to announce that SUNUP is now mobile friendly. You can watch our show and your favorite segments anytime on the go at sunup.okstate.edu. I'm Lyndall Stout. We'll see you next time at SUNUP.